Tonight's program will include readings from recent National Medal of Arts recipient N. Scott Momaday and a discussion with our moderator, Dr. Raina Green, from the National Museum of American History. I hope you'll stay after the program. You'll have a chance to meet our guests, get books signed, and get some snacks in the Potomac Atrium. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Raina Green and N. Scott Momaday. pleasure and honor tonight of introducing to you uh, Scott Mamaday. We'll begin with a reading and go on to the conversation. Scott. I bet that was my cue. To... That was your cue. <laughs> all right. First of all, I would like to read something that I brought especially tonight. Uh, this uh, series, writer series, as you know, uh, is named for um, Vine Deloria who was a close friend of mine. And uh, it happens that before he died, I wrote him a song, an honor song, which he was able to read. And I'm very grateful that the timing was such that he, he could, uh, could read it. It was a gift to him that I was able to make in time. So I want to read it to you. It's called An Honor Song in the Old Style for Vine Deloria, Jr. Where words were first shaped into sacred bundles and placed on altars of earth and stone, we made prayers of thanksgiving, glad to have been summoned, glad to have been given names, glad to have been touched by the sun, glad to have heard the silence. Where visions were first born upon sacred winds and glittered on the darkness of our camps. We sang of our well-being, proud to have been summoned, proud to have named our destiny, proud to have spoken the sunrise, proud to have broken the silence. Where thunder rolled across the world and rain rattled on the ancient trails and on the shadows of origin, we danced the days of our dreaming, whole in the summons of life, whole in the names of our deities, whole in the radiance of the sun, whole in the silence of the stars. Aho. Aho. Like many people here today, I've been rereading uh, Scott's work for the last several weeks, and I am so struck with the number of voices that inhabit your work, and they're voices from everywhere. It, 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 everyone from a, a mute young boy at Hamas to um, missionaries to Richard Henry Pratt to Billy the Kid to um, a middle-aged artist in San Francisco, a, a whole world. Um, where do these voices come from, Scott? How, how, how so many and how so complicated and complex? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I, I, ha I hear voices um, all the time, <laughs> probably a little, you know, I wonder about that sometimes. Um, but, uh, uh, no, I've had a world of experience, actually. I've been able to travel a good deal, and I've seen interesting parts of the world, and goodness knows I've met interesting people along the way. And I'm always on the lookout for something that uh, I might use uh, in my writing, uh, and uh, just, just as a photographer, and I can say this because I am an amateur photographer, always looking for, you know, something that uh, will make a very memorable image. And eventually you can train yourself so that you can spot these things and record them. Uh, most often we miss them, don't we? But 
but if you practice long enough and you, you see things and you, you compose them uh, in your head uh, and then in the lens, the eyepiece of the camera, you can have pretty good success with that. And so it is with writing. You meet people and uh, something about them um, catches your interest. Mm -hmm. And so, lo and behold, there, there, is, uh, there is the raw material for a character. And you, you go from there. Um, and, and sometimes these are just little, very little uh, uh, habits of, and manners, you know. Like uh, someone sucking his cheek. You know, everybody does it. But nobody, nobody uh, stops to, uh, to make that... Uh, a picture of the character uh, necessarily. So things like that, uh, someone who has a, a kind of tick in the eye, that becomes a, an identifying feature of, of the character, someone who speaks in a particular way. So all of these little things, if you notice them and, and uh, pay attention to them and catch them you know, in your imagination, that's, that's all grist for the mill. So... I don't, other than that, I'm not sure where the voices come from. I, I, I don't want to accuse him of channeling in Billy the Kid, but <laughs> it could have happened. Uh, I, I was also thinking, these, it, it's not only the voice, the, the incredibly complex and many, many voices that inhabit your work, but it's place and time. You know, you're in the 19th century one minute, and, and in the next piece, you're in the world as we know it right now uh, it is it's a world where um, dogs talk and bears inhabit the world and at the same time it's a world where literary critics and old missionaries speak together so I, it fascinates me how you somehow can cross all of that territory well, uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you, you have put your finger on something that, uh, that I have tried to do, certainly, and that is to astonish God. Uh, sometimes I have succeeded, I think, uh, but by such things as putting Billy the Kid together with an old Indian and having them talk together. That's, you know, that's just purely imaginary, but... Uh, also fascinating to me, and it is, it is the stuff of, uh, of writing, creative writing. So, yes, uh, you know, if you, if you go through my writing, I guess you see a lot of different and unexpected uh, juxtapositions, and I can't explain that any more than I can explain uh, how, you know, composers compose pieces of music, great music, and interesting music, and bad music that is, n that is nonetheless interesting uh, just happens. It's a gift of God or, or something of the kind.